I'm Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, and this is Rendering Unconscious. My guest today is Dr. Lada Shiha, a psychoanalytic practitioner, scholar, and activist, and president-elect of the Society for Psychoanalysis and Psychoanalytic Psychology, Division 39 of the American Psychological Association. As with all Rendering Unconscious podcast episodes, there is a video of this up at YouTube. If you'd like to watch the conversation, just visit Trapart Films' YouTube channel. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T Film at YouTube, or search for Rendering Unconscious podcast. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry, published by Tupart Books, 2019. For more, please visit our publisher's website, tripart.net. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T dot net. You can support the podcast at our Patreon. Just visit patreon.com forward slash V-A-N-E-S-S-A 2-3-C-A-R-L Your support is so appreciated. Thank you so much to all of our Patreon patrons. You make this possible. To follow Dr. Lada, she has work. Follow her Instagram at psychoanalyst activist. You can also follow me on Instagram at raw sin underscore. That's R-A-W-S-I-N underscore at Instagram and Twitter. Links to everything discussed in this episode can be found in the text accompanying the episode. You can visit the podcast main website for more information and for links to everything. That's renderingunconscious.org. You can also find out more about the podcast and other events and happenings at my website, drvanessasinclair.net. Sign up for my newsletter for updates. How do you push through limitations by being in community? Um, And I keep coming back to that. Like, this is where I'm at right now about a reorientation to the way we do things and how you tap in and out of communities that are either generative and destructive in the best of ways um, and draining. And I feel like that pandemic you know, sort of sparked a a lot of that process of thinking through what that actually means, not on a surface level, but on a systemic level. And I suppose it's not, shouldn't be a surprise, but I'm shocked that it feels like for a lot of the portion of our field, like, what did you even learn from, what did you learn from the pandemic? Um, How, how can talk about regression (laughs) I feel like it's more than regression I feel like it's like psychotic processes like you just entirely reverted disavow yeah yes yeah to to a normal that was constructed to begin with and that you have such libidinal energy invested in it it's not a world I can live in (laughs) No, and it makes me ultra disappointed that these are psych- psychoanalysts, and it's like, are like, it's exactly the thing of like psychology being used as a tool of the state. And I was hoping that psychoanalysis and psychoanalysts were a bit different, 
but it seems to be overall just like a different spin on the same issue. It's a different flavor. Let's <laughs> say that. Yeah. <laughs> but, it, tries to be, but, it thinks of itself as like the more sophisticated. It's the more sophisticated yeah. uh, oppressive tool of the state. <laughs> yes. Well, and especially if you're thinking about it in a in a more normative structural way, right? And, and maybe that's the original. I won't say maybe. I think that's the original issue, is to think that somehow you live outside of this structure or that you are special in some way and it's just a retooling of the same you know issues that oppress people if you actually think that you are different you're then at once enacting harm and claiming innocence from it it's the worst possible combination that you can do so i had to unlearn this idea that somehow psychoanalysts were different because that set up a space not only for a consistent disappointment in the field, but a deflection from the logics that create oppression and create oppressive structures that there was always like a valve of innocence that somehow people reclaimed every once in a while, right? Um, sort of like white liberalism <laughs> or, or liberal humanism or something like there's a valve of innocence. And I've become really interested in like, okay, what are the limitations of that? And is it our right for us to just have like a wall that a wall of refusal and one that sort of on the very basics just says no this like the central piece here is harm that is the structure um that's how it was built this is not by accident this is um sort of ensuring up a very specific type of social and in this case psychic order and if we don't think about it like that, I really worry that we'll continuously fall into these spaces, right? I mean, we're, both you and me are on many different listservs together and this, you know, conversation about the psychoanalytic stance, <laughs> you know, um, there, the only consistent psychoanalytic stance I have seen across the board is one that recalibrates itself to maintain it's normalcy and normativity, and that also means maintaining methods and ways in which harm is done. Is that the only possibility? No, otherwise I wouldn't take up psychoanalysis, but the urgency and the consistency in which that is done on a collective scale is sometimes you get whiplash from it. <laughs> you know, I, know I mean, I know we've talked about this. <laughs> No, I know. And this most recent example with Don Moss's paper, it's just like, it's just horrifying to see. And then the immediately, like, silencing, trying to silence the conversation. Um, yeah, it's just like, right. how does everyone not see what is happening in real time? Yes. Yes. Well, and I think there's a managing of, like, the narrative, right? Managing of the parameters. What's fascinating about that this recent instantiation of it is a couple of things. And some of this I've been in conversation with, with colleagues and trusted friends about yourself included, um, about how I read this. And then an, an, another angle of this that I had um, myself fell into the trap of completely overlooking. But as soon as it was pointed out by a colleague, and I don't have his permission to sort of say this, so I won't disclose his name, but I shout out because I don't want to um, take credit for thinking through this. But once it was presented to me, I was like, of course. Um, number one, I think that he's being, uh, Don is being received as a race traitor. And that's the most fascinating thing is like, there's a certain amount of um, disruption that a system will um, consent to hold, mm -hmm. right? That a lot of folks think about oppressive systems as just crude oppression and sort of like being being like, no, immediately when there's a dissenter, I'm going to, you know, lock down and not let that happen. But it's far smarter than that. That's why it's insidious. Like it's arbitrary. Um, even though it has a logic, there's an arbitrariness to it. The closer you get to positions of power, the more likely that's going to happen because then you become threatening. The more you get to the sort of texture of the actual logic itself, like that it's 
it, it has to do with capitalism, it has to do with alienation, it has to, the more likely there'll be a clap down. But there's so much expan expansiveness in systems of oppression. And, and they, they by default hold the ability to hold contradictions that they also surprise us how they work sometimes. Like what is the difference between the countless articles that Donna's already written and this one, right? Like, why is this the one that I have a sense it's because there was the mention of parasitic in there about whiteness. Um, the irony of it is that most of these places that we're taking this up, we're not even paying to go past the paywall, which let's talk about that in general, that there's a paywall to knowledge, but they were taking the abstract and sort of building upon that. The only way that can gain so much momentum this quickly is if there are already tropes in which it can capitalize on and find traction in, right? There's no way that an abstract can generate that much collective fodder and sort of psychic energy unless it already comfortably fit into a framework um, or a sort of systems of logic that already exist for us. So this idea of a race trader, like this was the limitations that we can accept this can expand the system expand enough for even maybe for us to start thinking about black lives matter how that comes in let's do you know equity and diversity inclusions and in, in south Atlantic institutes let's push for this let's start to talk about listeners let's let's listen to voices that maybe otherwise weren't we see all these statements coming out from institutes right and any of us who have any sense of this sort of manic flight could have seen ahead of time that there's a limitation to that right there's a there's a sort of a ricochet back that comes from it i was waiting on what would be that what is the limitations of this expansiveness now you and i both know of course the depth of that was a little bit shaky like we're sitting there back being like okay you're sending out these statements but you're not willing to underwrite training for folks of color you're we can see and we can be cynical like that but just from a larger framework what are the limitations and it's it was so interesting to me the way that i'm reading it is that the limitations of that and where it hit a wall was when somebody was truly experienced as a race trader and not in a liberal sense because liberalism also holds a lot of expansiveness to be progressive and to push up against things but when that wall of like you're starting to say that whiteness is parasitic that that feels really dangerous because you're one of us you now have become an and a quote-unquote native informant about the white experience and that's too much for us right um so that's one angle of it and then the colleague who brought something to mind that i i i hadn't haven't had the chance to talk to him to be able to say that it was him who said this but the journal edition that this came out in also showcased black and brown voices the two black folks who are in it are people that are known in the field that are pretty famous um and then a younger uh, brown colleague who i'm very respectful of as well and um or have a lot of respect for and their vo their pieces are entirely overshadowed mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now it's about whiteness and so that that's the point about these structures replicating themselves is like even in this even in sort of trying to give space as though we're the ones who own the ability to do that nobody's talking about those right all the energy is sucked up in the room it's entirely located in this one space and in these weird you know um sort of um un uh, uh, um amorphous ways right that i'm like you lose the the thread of like what are you actually talking about here um and if it were in psychoanalytic space if it were in clinic in clinical space that would be a moment where we'd be like what's happening here i can't remember where this started i don't know what shape it is but somehow in this it's like so threatening and at once people are so confident about what is happening that that's the part that for me is like this is why this is structural and embedded and goes back to an ideological position of what this whole field actually represents and what it shores up and what it refuses to seed as well you know no, that's a really good point 
That's a really good point. All the attention is focused on Don's article. I don't even know who else is in that issue. Now I'm going to have yes. to find out. But it's a really good point. It's exactly what it did. Yeah. Yeah. And and also like it's being disconnected from the fact that this is this was peddled by white supremacists. The people who put this out and took it up are white supremacists. This is why it got um, the traction that it did in the mainstream. I mean, psychoanalysis has been trying to break through for how long, <laughs> right? This yeah, is the exactly. thing that that does. And and what I'm finding is a sort of, again, a parallel process of a disconnect from the larger sociopolitical reading of the moment. There's a reason why this catapulted so that Tucker Carlson is talking about it, because it fits into a larger logics of white supremacy and fascism that this country, the settler colonial space, is dealing with. It's there. Right. There's no other way. This would have just complete like anything else would have completely come out. It would have been us, you know, preaching to the choir <laughs> uh, and and us being pretty happy that somebody's talking about whiteness and taking it up. Right. Um, but instead, it sort of finds itself imbricated in in these spaces that are are so uh, rife and alive in the present day. Like this, this wouldn't have found, it wouldn't have combusted in this way if the elements were, weren't there to make it happen. And that's completely disconnected from the conversation. You know? Yeah, absolutely. And that, that also reminds me of another thing that happened earlier in the year that I think is important to talk about is this tendency for academics to like abstract things that are happening in real life, like the phrase, I can't breathe, and then taking that phrase and turning it into something that's like sexy and like comparing it with film and like saying it's like a, you know, a phrase that has so many different meanings when it has a very specific meaning, you know, and that's a, that's a real problem as well. It like abstracts people's real lived experience, in this case, people being murdered and, yes. and to people talk about it in a theoretical way that I don't think that's useful. No, it's in fact it's violent, right? Because yeah. it's a it's a commodification of suffering, and in the context of this country, particularly black suffering, and it's and that thing you're talking about specifically was done for a fee, right? Um, there was no accountability in terms of how that's taken up, and our accountability as a field, like people. I can even give you space to say, whoa, I was entirely not thinking about this, which is, we have the language for that in psychoanalysis, <laughs> right? That it was unconsciously replicated, that it was outside of awareness, that, um, you know, that this was a sort of an unexamined space that um, finds itself in awareness. And now we have a moment where we can take it up and say, let's analyze what, what happened there. Right? What makes the conditions that something can come to the surface unexamined when perhaps in other areas of your life you would examine it? We have the tools for that. So for it to happen that way and then there be no response that uses the tools that were purported to have been used to analyze this is what is really the gaping hole here, right? What becomes legible as analyzable and usable and what doesn't and to what end? And that's what I'm constantly sort of thinking about. And this is not a, about being politically correct, even though, yeah, sometimes you have to be. Because that means you're taking into account the weight of history and material reality, right? And that word politically correct has been weaponized and sort of is always in dichotomous relationship with like freedoms. But if we're talking, do we really want to take up freedoms now? <laughs> because that, you know, that's a losing game for the people who usually are the ones who articulate that argument, right? That you're like impinging on my freedom or there's freedom of speech. The people who usually weaponize that are people who will lose that argument if we were to compare truly what you're talking about freedom and material reality. So I don't even want to go down that route, right? But it is an issue of like, you know, deference to social and material and political reality. And this is a moment where no, that is off limits. Because the impact of that is not equitably distributed, right? And your ability to, like you said, abstract it and use it in a sexy way and 
you know, I, honestly, I didn't even think it was really sexy. I think it was derivative, right? So, but again, that's the snark in me coming out. I want to stick to, which I, we, we get seduced into, but let's stick with the sort of political and material reality of this. For some people, it's an abstraction. And for some people, it's a matter of life and death. And that's really what we're talking about. That is mm-hmm. not an oversimplification, especially in this moment. And that's what I mean about like, what did you learn from this year? Right? Like a larger organizing framework of what did we learn from this year that these are not abstractions. People's suffering is not abstract. Extraction of labor is not an abstraction. Um, disproportionate murder is not an abstraction. State violence is not an abstraction, right? It's a luxury for people to engage with it as an abstraction, but for others, it's everyday life. And is, is psycho, does psychoanalysis have anything to offer that? I don't think it's in the space of abstraction. You know me, I believe our, our voices belong in these struggles, but they belong in these struggles in as much as we're tools to disrupt normative processes not to shore them up and then charge a pretty fee for it too right and that's the yeah, commodification exactly. piece you know yeah not to seem like you're addressing it when when exactly when it's being commodified because it's and it's like a it's like seem like it's being talked about like as if we're like oh we're all addressing it but really it's in the same structure that's the same part of the issue right Right. And that's the question is like, what's being produced here? And I don't mean that in a capitalist mode of production. Right. I mean that in an ethical imperative for us to examine the things we take up and for for what reason we take them up and from from what spaces within us, which is the most psychoanalytic question we can ask. Where is this movement and energetic sort of uh, force coming from in the deepest ways? that we're talking, that is the psychoanalytic question to me, right? And in the moments where like that questioning is foreclosed, that's a clue to me that something else is happening. And that usually is the space of political analysis. Like where does power and analysis of power come into this? Where does the, where does the analysis of political and material reality come into this? Um, you can sort of dip in and out of this and use it in a particular way and others can't, that means you're not, uh, you know, and the depth that I would hope we would take up a power analysis, you know, and just because something's available to you doesn't mean you need to take it up. That's what I mean about what is being produced here? What is the end goal? What are we sort of thinking through and what are we not thinking through when we take issues up? Not this imperiousness of everything is ours to do what we will with, to ask a question with, to um and that's not and i don't mean that to say you should people should stay in their lane i mean take accountability for the lanes you choose to be in right and if there isn't if you can't if somebody comes and says i i would like an explanation for why you have chosen to be in this lane in this particular way that the response hopefully if one is politically aligned and has gone through the political analysis and the sort of power analysis is not one of defensiveness, but one of um, articulation, one of positioning oneself, one of locating oneself, and the humility to say, even if I've gone through all these processes, that perhaps other people who have lived reality can sort of tell me I'm still going about this the wrong way. You know, I, I that's the world I want to live in. Yeah, absolutely. You know. Um. We need to talk about your conference and we need to talk about Palestine. Yes. Two big questions. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Which way first? I will also say though, commenting on what we were just talking about, um, this is why I'll say like John Stewart got me through the Bush years. I watched John Stewart religiously through the Bush years, but I had to stop watching the Late Show with Colbert during the Trump years because I started seeing how much this was a part of keeping the system in place. It's like gives you a space where like this person is allowed to joke about it, make fun of this person, makes him seem more lighthearted than he is. Like, oh, this president's an idiot, he's a goofball, and really this is like really malicious shit and yes. how it keeps the whole thing it's like a pressure release valve that keeps the whole thing in place and that's one of the kinds of structures that you're talking about yes yeah it's the pal 
it's making everything palatable and the liberal discourse around that right and and the harm that that does and and for our field it's sort of i feel like there's such a um fear about healthy splitting that i'm it's all right i've said this before like you and i have had this conversation like why if 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 there were any time to be militant it would be in regard to fascism that is not splitting i don't think i am doing anything um sort of worthwhile both cognitively or emotionally to open up the space for me to understand where a fascist is coming from or to um, rehabilitate fascism to make it more palatable there are plenty of people who are already doing that work why is that what we're choosing to do our work doing and i think that's the argument or the 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 um critique i would have of these sort of liberal talking heads um like colbert or like any one of these people who, again, at, I mean, at his best, he's a liberal, right? Um, the, for me, what's disturbing about those those spaces is also the inbuilt, insufferable jingoism that comes with them. And as an Arab immigrant watching these shows, you really, I mean, you, you get used to the sort of daily violence that's done so casually right by the assumptions that are made by united states um you know imperialism and exceptionalism but that falls differently on somebody who's an immigrant to this country who um has seen in the last in my lifetime the middle east be decimated by the united states so these comments of like well, we're american or let's rive above it or of that are so inbuilt in the talking points mm -hmm. right and he's speaking to his audience. I'm not saying that that's not. But when you recognize what the ideological packaging of this is and what is it doing, what is it shoring up and what is it detracting from and who is it targeted towards and what is it um, patched back up that doesn't need patching up. It needs destruction. Like not all destruction is bad. There's some things that do need to be destroyed, right? But this angling of jingoism just becomes so intolerable that i just i can't even go there you know and it's like even every day they're like the most powerful man in the world the greatest country in the world the most powerful man it's like you have the biggest military and you're the biggest bully yes <laughs> and who are you <laughs> reminding the most powerful person in the world exactly. <laughs> and who are you reminding like i'm sitting there listening to it with a clinical ear being like who, who are you it's like seeing flags everywhere have you for forgotten where you live? Flag. Just in so case you flags. forget. <laughs> yeah, and I didn't even start noticing it until I, I was with Carl and he would visit me all the time and like we'd be driving up a highway in Florida and it's just like, you know, a car lot like lined with American flags and, he, and then there's like a giant one, you know, that's like hundreds of feet tall and he's like, what is this, you know? But like when you, when you yeah. grow up in it, like I didn't even notice it before. It's just like, that's just how it is, right? Right, uh, that's right. It's exactly so and brainwashing and propaganda definitely and i think you know late night programming is a part of that and a lot of folks would be like well can't you just turn off your brain at any point no i can't because that's the whole point is the anesthetizing us and sort of atomizing us so that we're not thinking about these things but everything has a point and a purpose in mm -hmm. anesthetizing us into a mode of being and a way of being that by default excludes all other modes of being and liberation, right? That's the anesthetization that comes with that. And I don't, I don't want to be a part of that. I don't want to be seduced by that. All of us can be seduced by that. And so rather than risking that seduction, I refuse, right? Which is, which is a, is a mode of resistance too, is a refusal to engage in these processes that are demeaning that, that, capitalism does on to all of us but also living of course in the belly of the beast in the united states well this is a good segue into perhaps into palestine but mm -hmm. the only other place that i have visited that consistently has the same amount of flags is what is now known as israel <laughs> right and what did they both share their settler colonization colonies. exactly their settler colonial states that's built on stolen land and there's something very psychoanalytic to me to think about if you are 
perpetually disavowing a truth, right, or denying or however you want to say it or splitting off or, or, or in a psychotic reality of yours, there's something about a marking, a constant marking, a constant reminder that also to me betrays a guilt, right? Mm -hmm. And not a guilt in as much as you feel bad for it, a, a recognition that this is not yours, mm -hmm. right? Because I don't think people feel bad about being colonizers or settlers, but there's something really deeply disturbing about that common, and I, and I realized it the first time I went to Palestine, I was like, oh my God, I was like looking around and Steve and I were walking around, I'm like, the, it's immediate. You see the similarities. It's not by chance that, you know, settler colonial state sees settler colonial state and wants to support it. It's, it's not just a geopolitical issue. I think it's an ideological and psychic reflection of each other, you know, mm -hmm. which Stephen has talked about in his book on Islamophobia about like taking up the anti-Semitic myth that somehow Israel um, controls the United States. And in his book, he talks about, he's like, absolutely not. And, but the reason why is that there's a settler colonial kinship that they see in each other, you know? That makes a lot of sense. No, that, that's what I've been thinking about lately too and talking to Carl about. It's like this constant assertion of like American and America and the flag. And like, it's exactly because they keep reasserting themselves because they're not standing on solid ground. This is not, this is not yours. You right. Know. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And so there's there's a necessity to keep asserting that. And in many ways, it gives us a playbook about how consistent our struggle has to be. Right. Because if if that is what's needed to perpetuate the myth that you are of this place, then it gives us a playbook about what's needed to disrupt that process. So this isn't, which is sort of what, if we're sort of talking about what's happening in Palestine right now, is what Palestine Palestinians and Palestinian activists have told us for so long is that there is no like moment in which this is happening. This needs to be a consistent and collective solidarity struggle mm -hmm. because we're, we are targeting a logic, not a moment in time. Like a lot of folks would, would want to sort of talk about it as this being land grabs in Sheikh Jarrah right now, that this is what this like sort of spontaneously erupted um, because of the current land grabs and land confiscation happening in occupied Jerusalem in Sheikh Jarrah. And what it, I think that is a misreading of the situation because what we have seen since 1948 and even prior to that is this is the log this is the logical extension of what we understand of settler colonialism. It's not just a moment in time. And if we're not consistently speaking to these issues, if we're not consistently bringing them to the forefront um, in tandem with other liberation struggles like liberation of indigenous folks in other settler colonies or the liberation of black folks the world over, um, then we can see why we don't make any headway, right? Because the, the, if there's a constant reassertion, like you're saying, the reassertion of dominance then the same amount of pressure, if not more, needs to be sort of applied to m make dents in that. Yeah, that reminds me of the psychic way the psyche works and like psychoanalysis as well, because like when analysis come in, they often want people, I, I wanted it too, people want like something to just all of a sudden shift and now everything's different and new. But when you are going through the process, you learn that it has to, you have to constantly like make different choices. Like you're so ingrained in a pattern that once you become aware of the pattern, you know, and you see it, that's not enough. You know, just the awareness, but you have to constantly reassert a new way of being, making a different choice. Or if you find yourself falling into the pattern again, you have to go, oh, wait, I'm in the, doing this again and like make a different choice. And you have to do that for years, you know, yes. until that new way of being feels natural and it becomes your yeah. more automatic way. Yeah. And then, and then we're up against, in addition to that, that we're up against a sort of recognizing it as an ideological entrenchment. So that's even harder because it goes back to the sort of Steve Colbert and what you're talking about is the messaging comes from a lot of places and some mm -hmm. of them so invisibilized to us that we don't even recognize that's what's happening mm -hmm. right so this unlearning and 
uh, relearning and this decentering and recentering becomes really important, which of course what decolonial and sort of liberatory struggles are, are always working towards, right? How do we decenter what has sold itself as a as the focal point of everything? And that sells itself so much so that we we're not even realizing that that's what's happening. But again, your point is so well taken because that is, I think, why psychoanalysis feels like a uh, liberatory language for me, potentially, because it has the concepts for that already. We talk about, we've said this before, we talk about structural change. There's a reason why people are seen, even though I think that that point has been lost a little bit. There's a reason why people come in for four or five times a week, right, is because we understand the pressures upon systems, including the body system, to recalibrate to a, um, a status quo. But somehow when we try to extrapolate that to the larger systems, people are just like, I have no idea what you're talking about. What do you, I, I this is a foreign concept to me. <laughs> yeah, and then the same thing with the analytic position, like you said before, like people on list are saying, oh, we have to maintain the analytic position. And even if you do that, like when you're with an analysis and like you don't tell them what to do or give them advice or something like that, that doesn't mean that you're just supposed to be like neutral and not having any sort of being, you know, yes. in every sort of other area, of course, even trying to do that is taking a position. Yeah. Also, there is not only one, right? But it's oftentimes talked about like that, the capital T, capital A, capital P, the analytic position, right? Um, and a lot of people, when you push them on that, will be like, well, of course, no, I don't ascribe to that. But everything you are um, pushing for actually does end up falling in that to say that there is one pure or more pure way of doing it. Everything else that falls outside of that is in relationship to it or decentered or peripheral. Right. And then it's the onus on people who might take up those positions to prove themselves constantly. And that never happens because you don't, you, there, it, it's an impossibility to get to the place where those positions are, uh, are normative if it's always in relationship to the center, right? That's sort of reinscribing itself as the center constantly. Um, but yeah, I, I'm always, it's, it's fascinating to watch it unfold and it's a real time, it's real time right, to see how these things work and who partakes in it and who pushes up against it and what are the ways in which even the group process replicates these larger issues. Um, and then the fear that's involved in like what it generates. And I don't know about you, but like, I don't wanna be part of something that is so static and so completely, um, you know, afraid of any movement that the second that something gets, um, there's an upheaval that people are so terrified of being annihilated. Like there's something fundamentally fucking wrong with your system. If the second there's an upheaval, you feel like you're going to be swallowed into the ground. I'm not staying around to watch, watch you fall through those cracks. <laughs> <laughs> uh -uh. You know? No. And that, you know, that also reminds me like a lot of times when people are making these changes in, in psychoanalysis, like when they're in treatment, you know, there there is a period that they have to go through, which I call the void, where they have to be able to tolerate those anxieties and, and in order to be able to make changes in their lives because, you know, you stay in what's familiar because it's familiar and even if it's something you don't want or messing you up, you keep doing it anyway because that's what you know. And when you start doing things differently, it feels scary and we, we're supposed to help people like, we're like supposed to help hold that for people so that they can make these changes in their lives and their selves. But then in, in the analytic community, it's like there's no space for that. Right, right. Yeah, and it's, it's, and it's funny because I you know, it is what people know, but it's also what's consistent being told to them that they need to stay in, mm. right? Because it, there, anytime there's a sort of push against, let's say, a hegemonic power, hegemonic mode of being, there is a retaliation that comes in, in different ways. But again, we were talking about before how it's expansive, right? And you don't know when it's going to come. But in very minute and then also bigger ways, you're consistently getting messages about you being the one that is 
non-normative when folks are in treatment and they have to reconfigure let's say their community or what their idea or what aligns with them the message is always one that locates the fault within them and that's why it's easy to stay in what we know it's not just that it's comfortable it's that there's an active mm -hmm. right messaging around moving out of your place and that can fall on gender lines on race lines on class lines on cl uh, lines of ability um, and then, of course, the intersections of all of them, the more the more that messaging is clear. And that's what sort of Fanon is very clear about of this messaging of stay in your place. That that's colonialism's logic specifically to say that, mm -hmm. right, is to um, adjudicate and push and shore up a particular social order in which social roles are predetermined and any movement and it becomes invisible until there's movement beyond those borders that have been set and then it clamps down in a very particular way mm -hmm. and that, that's why collectivity is so important that's why solidarity movements are so important that's why making community is so important because when you refuse that atomization, when you you refuse to live in spaces that are fundamentally alienated from other people and other struggles, um, you can exact that reality in, and it's not, and it's not doesn't feel lonely. I think that void you're talking about oftentimes is because people feel lonely in that because their socialization is around I'm struggling through this alone, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and with the, the whole like rhetoric around mental illness and it being something in the person that somebody needs to change or needs to medicate rather than it being a systemic issue. Yes, exactly. And 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 our symptomatology necessarily being mediated by it, it's it's mediated by that. There's no way to think about it as untouched by structures. You know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That have Can we this talk about your impact. conference? <laughs> yeah. Your conference was revolutionary. <laughs> our, our, we worked hard, you know, just I want to give a sh shout out to my sisters in the struggle, Leilani Salvo Crane and Nadine Abed, who um, are, were co chairs with me in this, and of course, our amazing steering committee that stuck with us for three years um, because. It got canceled. Like the last time you and I met was like right before, right? Yeah, I was supposed to come to New York, and yes. then and then everything shut down. Yes, and um, you were actually me. the ones that canceled the conference first before everything Correct. got shut down. You guys took preemptive measures and were like, "We're just going to postpone this." Yeah, we had to, and I think that's that was the ethos of the conference from the beginning. And I'm really proud that we were able to maintain that. I mean, to speak to how doing things in community is much easier than doing things alone and how to sustain a certain pressure on systems that is much easier to, they would much rather recalibrate to a, an equilibrium that feels uh, known and um, comfortable and um, charring up for for the the very few at the top and so our our sort of um orientation to the entire project of this conference was one of can we consistently push ourselves to always be attentive um talk about even hovering attention right to be attentive to all the moving pieces, no matter how complicated they might be. And that doesn't mean that that was successful at all times, but because we were three, and then we had our wonderful steering committee, that there was always a, a consensus building exercise that allowed each of us with our own strengths to come in and be like, watch out for this, look out for this, look out for this. And a, a trust that we built over time, that that is what we were doing that when something didn't feel aligned with our larger mission, uh, that one of us would take that up, that there was a trust that there was no way that we were under the pretense that one of us could hold on to that at all times. It was very much a fluid process of us working in concert to be like, we we agree that these are the important things and that's what we want to keep our, our um, focus on. And that decision to cancel was a part of that.
because nothing had shut down yet. New York wasn't even in a state of emergency yet. I think the day we sent out the, the alert was when New York went into a state of emergency. Um, and we had already drafted that letter before and we were pushing upon it. But our idea was, what are we communicating when we open up a space of vulnerability for certain members of our community and not others? That there will always be people who have the luxury or the space internally or the resources monetarily to take these chances and there are others that will either be coerced to take the chance and end up paying the price for that or feeling like this is an unnecessary choice that they're being pulled into. And so that really was the basis of our decision to be like, we cannot in good conscience say that we are trying to shift our space and our focus as a field to be more mindful of all the multimodal ways of being um, and then make a decision that, like, by default excludes 85% of people, you know. Um, and th that's why we made that, and, and it turned out to be the best decision we could have made, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, that was actually, you doing that, I was like, okay, something serious. This is serious. That's what made yeah. me realize how serious this was. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, and there are... I don't want to downplay there are losses that come with that people you know monetary losses not as much because I know there was a lot of shifting which is amazing again this is to talk about the expansiveness of systems like capitalism on the one hand, before this oh no we can't refund anything and then as soon as this happens there's somehow like enough room to expand to look like you're being magnanimous when you're really doing the bare minimum of like um, recognizing that everybody is dealing with a global pandemic and it would be unfair to, to, to gouge people or steal their money, right? I'm not going to give you a cookie for that. But um, I'm talking about sort of like airlines and hotels and stuff like this. Um, mm -hmm. I think people that we heard consistently that people felt like they lost the space of congregation, of, of um, community like we're talking about, of a comradeship. And, but it wasn't that space was not worth it because there and this is what we mean about material reality like there's there's a loss of something abstract that might turn material if you're actually in real life because you do have real relationships with people but the other side of that is a material reality of who is disproportionately affected by this right and who continues to be disproportionately affected by this i i i think we're talking about the pandemic as a past thing a lot of the times and this again I'm seeing this a lot happening in the United States context mm -hmm. um, which is like a, a manic defense to get back I, to what I don't know um, I mean I do know but I don't want to know I don't want to be part of that normal um, and of course the prioritizing of economy in a very specific way when um, most of the world is still dealing with this mm -hmm. in acute ways, not even in like subsidiary ways, in acute ways of not having access to vaccines because the United States has a, and other powers have a hegemony over the patents or over um, um, sort of being able to distribute, right, vaccines. Um, we have places actively in the world who are still in spike mode and people are dying every single day, India being a huge part of that, right? But other parts of my comrades in South Africa who are still on in lockdown. And there's this like way, again, it feels like everything we're talking about has a parallel process in these larger issues, a way in which some parts of society can function in this vacuum where you can truly come to believe that the pandemic is over, where those of us who also have connections to those places are living like double and triple lives at the same time, trying to keep up with what's happening and maintaining this psychotic world that we live in here, you know? Yeah. And, um, my, you know, I'm from Miami originally and my family's in Florida and like during spring break, you know, they opened up everything so that they could have all of that money come into the state. Yes. And, you know, then I heard when uh, when the U.S. started opening, because apparently the pandemic's over there, um, which is insane. Um, they were saying like, oh, now the now the whole U.S. can be like Florida, you know, was, Florida never really shut down and, and kept the party going, basically. Um, and yeah, to watch it all play out is just horrifying from over here. <laughs> 
<laughs> I mean, I'm going to say this to a Floridian because I can, right? And because I have a relationship with you, but um, Floridian is the word, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I mean, that must be harrowing to say the whole United States can be like Florida. <laughs> Don't. Don't do it. <laughs> Wrong way. There's so many reasons. <laughs> right? White supremacy being at the at the bottom of this. Yeah, I mean, and that's, I think, just to sort of circle back around, and I promise I haven't, you know me now well enough to know that I talk in these big circles, but I come back around to what we were talking about, is that this is the space in which the conference came to be and ended up uh, evolving into, uh, where we did have a good year of just being like, what is going to happen? And here we were again in March of 2021 with a very solid reality principle that the pandemic was, um, is not done and we're still not done. And so we, um, you know, Division 39 was very uh, supportive of us kind of shifting everything online. And we feel like that's also a really important um, step and a precedent to take and maybe a rethinking and a reimagining of the ways that conferences look. And I know you and I have had this conversation too. And if we're really serious also about climate crisis, can we just reimagine the way these things are done? Do we all need to be traveling everywhere for these conferences? Um, are there ways in which these continuously regurgitate the inequities that we say we're so against when we're having our conferences in places that um, fundamentally exclude certain people, unless they're living in the city and unless they have transportation to these, you know, hotels that we hold conferences in, who are we actually inviting into our spaces and who are we actively excluding? Um, and that's one of the things we saw with this conference is having it online. Uh, we had 850 registrants uh, for an online platform and each space that I went to, um, each event that I attended or I was popping in and out of places because I wanted to be supportive to the people who gave their labor and their time to present in this uh, format for us, that there were hundreds of people in each on each Zoom link, right? Whereas in person, you're limited to the space that's there and you've been to these conferences before some spaces like won't hold more than 30 people um, so and you're having to make decisions of what do i go to what i don't go to so some of the logics it opened up a space where we could really reimagine what our spaces look like and what that actually meant in terms of accessibility and who are we inviting in and i think some of the people who ended up being part of these panels um, i don't think the space would have been hospitable to outside of that whether that's artists or underrepresented folks or um, students in ways they're, you know, um, through their amazing labor and volunteer work, which I'm still conflicted about because they still have to put in the labor, um, that were able to partake in this in a way where they didn't feel like they were navigating as an outsider, but rather as a, a central piece of making this work. Mm -hmm. it, that their labor created this too. Um, so we're, we were co-chairs, but without our volunteers that were checking people in, that were giving this, there's no way this could have worked. Yeah, I'm, that is not an overstatement. That is a shout out to every single one of them, many of whom I adore, <laughs> um, who did this labor for all of us. Yes, thank you. And I, I really see that conference as a big shift in the field, because like I've told you before, I never imagined uh, seeing a conference like that through APA or Division 39 ever. Yeah. And I also have to correct myself because I never say you guys, and this is my inner inner colonizer or whatever has gotten into me. It's specifically a conference by three women of color. And then I said, you guys did this, 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 and I heard it and I just made me angry and I had to point it out to myself <laughs> and to you. Thank you. So, I apologize I mean, see, for that. You're, you're good. And this is how easy it is, is to catch ourselves in, in cis heteronormativity and be like, this is what we use even. A, and, and there are folks who will say, this is policing language. And if there are a lot of modes of policing that people are okay with, but this is where the, like the buck stops, <laughs> you know? Um, 
that's not what I would consider policing. I consider being stopped by TSA at, at you know, orange level constantly as the policing I'm going to be wanting to worry about, not if I'm actually being mindful about uh, the ways in which my language communicates that I hold certain people in mind and not just a very particular sample of society, right? Uh, but what you just modeled is that's exactly all it is. Now you and I have a trusting relationship. I know you and that I don't want to downplay that. That is a part of it. But a lot of folks are just asking for the decency of sort of being um, held in mind. Um, and that if that can emanate from a political stance that includes power and includes a mode of analysis around who gets erased then fantastic. That's obviously that's the ideal position. I don't want to take like a, a liberal position of it's, it's um, you know, love is love. <laughs> right? Right. I see no color. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, I so appreciate the feedback. And I know you and I were in conversation constantly while the co- conference was happening. And I think I sent you the the photo of headquarters <laughs> from mm-hmm. um, from my dining room. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but one of the things we consistently heard was how this felt different. And mm-hmm. there's a lot of lot of parts of it that we would continue to work on. It's not you know we're not sort of okay this is done and we don't continue with with the struggle of course there's this continued struggle to be done. But I think for me, one of the most meaningful parts of this, not only seeing who made up our audience and truly getting feedback from them about feeling like spaces that at one point were completely inhospitable, felt for the first time like a place they could be and engage and know that they were um, seen or heard or, or, um, safe within the confines of safety. We understand that spaces often cannot be safe because of white supremacy, because of the way they're structured. But to the degree that they could, they were, right? And that was different. The other thing that I heard feedback about and which was really moving to me was the decentering of English as a primary mode of communication. And that you that feels so small because for a country that sort of says, oh, it's a, we're a melting pot, we're all of this, the centrality and and the associations that come with the logistics of English and with being able to um, articulate oneself in English in a very particular way to meet standards of professionalism or so on and so forth, um, that this was a space where I heard Spanish, Arabic, there was a keynote in French that was simultaneously um, translated and that was actively encouraged and people in chats were like really happy to be engaged in a way where they didn't have to rely on language as the primary mode of communication, which again is a part of our work. The centra- Even though the supremacy of language and the supremacy of English always finds itself into that seductive place, like that we forget that's not the only way that communication happens. Not only is that ableist, but it's entirely um a misconception of who makes up most of the world uh Mm -hmm. but folks that before had questioned well if we do a keynote in french like will people feel left out will people feel that already there's an assumption already there about who are the people you're talking about they're going to feel left out but overwhelmingly that actually the feedback we got was the moments where people didn't understand what was being said felt like the most meaningful because they could sit and take in an affective process. That if we're talking about clinicians or clinically minded people, that that is where a lot of our work lives. And the not having the language to fall back on actually provided the space where people could do that. And I, that's the part that I feel very proud of and feel like that was really meaningful. You know, and I'm not saying this to say like French is somehow such a sideline language, the language of the colonizer as well. But I think it shows the energy around English as a su- the supremacy of that when it's taken in like that. That's what was meaningful. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, other spaces to see what what we might call in sort of a decolonial perspective or po- post post um, structuralist perspective as subaltern languages. 
where there were entire um, uh, panels that folks were just speaking Arabic. That there were in in the one Palestine panel that Stephen was on um, Beirut and Palestine, and a shout out to all the amazing people that made up that panel, right? Um, Tarek, Nawal, uh, Salma, and Basim, and my husband Stephen. Um, that there was somebody from Palestine who called in and spoke in Arabic. And that there was a bit of a flurry of like, do we translate this? And then a, like a leaning in to be like, why? Who are we translating it for? Mm -hmm. And who needs to know? Who needs to hear this? Is that the purpose here? And when we're always in this process of kind of like going back to the question of what is being produced here, in that moment of translation, what what is happening and who is that for and 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 for for whose comfort? And I think eventually there was a sort of translation of some parts of it, but even when you translate, there's no way of communicating the affective tone without listening to that affective tone. So is it doing the thing you want it to do anyway? You know? Are there any events or anything coming up uh, on Palestine that people should know about? I know there's been a lot of different talks recently. Yes. So um, my comrades and colleagues in Palestine are, you know, despite being tired and exhausted, they're on it. So um, I'd say keep always keep an eye out on the um, Palestine Global Mental Health Network that in um, concert with the UK Palestine Mental Health Network has this Cafe Palestine that happens um, bi-weekly. Um, and my good friend and sister Nadira uh, Shalhoub Kabarukian is chairing it. And so there's a lot of real effort to get voices that are not always heard. So I think this past Saturday, uh, I was teaching all day, so unfortunately I missed it, but I'll be watching the video. Um, there were young activists and clinicians from Gaza, Gaza, talking. And that was really important for her. She was like, there are voices, just like everything else. I think we have to also see what are the voices we end up listening into only exclusively, and then who does that exclude? Um, and so she's making concerted effort to make those voices heard. I'm um, in the process also of working with uh, folks in Palestine on the ground and in the diaspora planning something, we'll be planning something about Palestine. So I'll be sure to pass that along to you when that comes up. Um, and then just across the board, I think also keeping an eye out on black solidarity and Palestinian solidarity events that are happening across the country. Um, Haymarket Press does a lot of really good ones. Noor Araqat is always doing these sort of things. Mark Lamont Hill is always um, platforming Palestinian voices. And I think that the importance of that is that there is this sort of pushback against how uh, on the one hand, recognizing the specificity of these struggles, and then the, on the other hand, if we're thinking about it from a systemic perspective, to see that there, there's a reason why there's um, black uh, solidarity with people in Palestine, right? Um, it, sort of uh, violence from police in the state being one of those things, but not the only thing. Um, listening to folks at Red Nation, Nick Estes and others who are involved in these struggles for the indigenous movement in um, Turtle Island with Palestine, those would be the places I would say. So sort of like Palestinians and then Palestinians with other groups that share a sort of historical bond um, connected by settler colonialism and sort of larger racist systemic oppression. And um, my Instagram is a place where all of that lives. Anytime I get, you know, my friends will send me something and just sort of post it. The other thing to keep a eye out on is Rabab Abdel Hadi, who's at SFSU and does through Ahmed, um, through her program, is constantly doing these unbelievable events. I don't know if you heard about this one with um, Leila Khaled that got kicked off of Zoom, kicked off of Facebook, kicked off of YouTube. They were like actively censoring um, because it was about Palestine and Leila Khaled is being a um, freedom fighter and... and um, so there's a concerted effort from Zionists to be like, um, and right-wing activists, racists, because um, that's what they share. Zionists and right-wing activists share racism. Um, that they were sort of sent 
flagging these videos. And so it was up for like 20 minutes. I was watching it live. This was happening several months ago. And they cut off the feed and then they'd switch to Facebook and then they cut off the feed there. And so those would be the spaces I would watch. And for those of us wondering why the importance of Palestine at this time is that there's there's nothing that gets canceled like this, that gets actively suppressed, that gets actively censored, that shouldn't warrant our attention. That needs to be a question of like, what is, what is so threatening about this, that there's an active censorship that's happening, right? It's the same thing with BDS, right? Boycott, divest, sanctions, movement. Uh, if it weren't so threatening, just like boycotting apartheid South Africa was, it's the same arguments that are made, by the way, um, then we wouldn't be having laws being passed in the United States that are saying that people cannot get funding from the government if they support BDS, or people having to sign waivers if they work within state institutions saying they won't support BDS. And this should be an outcry on all of us. And for those of us within psychoanalysis who say, oh, we're about holding the analytic position and allowing people space to think and freedom to engage and freedom to self-determination, that fundamentally runs counter to that. And that's why we need to be talking about these issues. And that, that is the sort of the ethos that was infused into our programming too, is thinking about what are the ways in which we disrupt the normative process? And where do our voices belong in the struggle as clinicians? That was the larger question. Was like, there are spaces and modes of inquiry that have always been like left off the radar with the same sorts of things you and I have talked about before. This is not psychoanalysis. You can't go there. You're being non-neutral. Well, what if that, that non-neutrality is actually somebody's being? What are we saying there and what are we communicating? And so this really was trying to open up a space to say, can we go to these spaces? Can we think about them? You know? Um, and also within the field, you're, you're not supposed to be neutral when it's suicide or homicide on the line, right? Even with an individual patient, this yes. is genocide. It's not, it's not, this is right. not something to be neutral about. This is, right. uh, this is genocide. Uh, on, That's right. on Black Americans, on Palestinians, on Native Americans. That's right. That's exactly right. And and the issue of suicide and homicide, it, like to be cynical about it, is because of largely because of liability, not because it's an ethical imperative to fight to align with folks who are fighting for their liberation and self determination. Like we should, there. Sh this is not complicated. It's not complicated. No. Should we stop with that? Yes. <laughs> this is not complicated. I love that. <laughs> yes, this is not complicated. And anybody who has um, any concerns about being complicated, I'm your person. <laughs> <laughs> For real. I always love how you're, I, I, I love about you, how you're always like, this is not a surprise because that's the other thing that you spoke about in the beginning. People like feigning, like, oh, how is this happening? And it's also surprising. It's like, this has been going on for centuries. This yes. is not a surprise. This is nothing new. Yeah, because that's how structures work. And if we know the logics of it, it shouldn't surprise us. You know, that doesn't mean it's not a struggle. It just shouldn't surprise us. Yeah, and sometimes, and sometimes the depth and how low people go it's a little surprising, but it's not surprising. But you're yes. just like, really? <laughs> exactly. Mm. Exactly. Thank you for listening to Rendering Unconscious. You've just heard a discussion with Dr. Lara Shiha. Follow her at Instagram at psychoanalyst activist. And now a track by Freudian Slit from the compilation album Coven, dedicated to the living memory of Lady J. Briar Peorage. This track is called The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. You can follow Freudian Slit's work at Instagram at Freudian Slit, the moniker for Kendall Abra. Candelabra's work 
Her poetry is also included in Rendering Unconscious, the book. Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry from Chapart Books, 2019. Visit our publisher's website, chapart.net. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T dot net for Rendering Unconscious, the book. You can find the album Coven as well as all of our other music at Highbrow Lowlife's Bandcamp page. That's highbrowlowlife.bandcamp.com. Enjoy. Thank you. 